I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. In this episode, I speak with longtime friend and Silver Core instructor, Darren Mott, on being a professional hunter, preparing for an African hunt, firearm and caliber selection, differences between North American and African guided hunts, what can go wrong, and how to ensure it doesn't. So I'm sitting down with Darren Mon. Darren, I've known you for many years now. You're a super interesting guy. Holy crow, the number of stories that you have and experiences, you live a very large life. I'm really, really happy to be able to sit down with you and kind of delve into a little bit of information, which I think would be very useful to the listeners. So you've got a background with firearms. You've got a background in hunting over in Africa and here. You've worked in the security related industries for years, being bodyguard and security detail for Oprah, for the Australian national cricket team and other very big names. I don't know if we can talk about them all, but uh, Darren, welcome to the Silver Corps podcast. Oh, thank you very much, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be here. One of the things that we were talking about before was hunting in Africa versus hunting in Canada and specifically here in British Columbia. Can we just get a little bit of a background on you and your, your hunting experience over in Africa? Sure. Well, as you can hear from my accent, I've, uh, I haven't lost it since of being here and that was 2005 when we came here, but I'm actually four generations African. And, uh, I say that to people and they get quite surprised seeing it, how I actually look like, but I grew up in Africa, born in, in Northern Rhodesia, which has changed its name to Zambia. Yeah. Lived all my life in Rhodesia, which changed its name to Zimbabwe. Right. And, you know, growing up in Africa, we were very fortunate because it was a, it was a, a special lifestyle. And, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed was the bush, the open spaces that we could access at any time and the abundance of wildlife we had there. During the Rhodesian days, it was very well managed, which meant that wildlife increased and was sustainable. And it sustained a very good hunting uh, operations. So as I grew up, I got more and more interested in it. And I started going out in the bush more and started doing some small game hunting, you know, like most, most youngsters that would, would do that. We were all trained in firearms. And I must mention that uh, from about 75 onwards, we had a pretty nasty civil war going on. So we were always taught how to use firearms from a young age, um, right. what the safety mechanisms were and where we could, could and couldn't go. So, you know, but we were also given a lot of latitude and responsibility. And I think the responsibility was a big thing for us. So, you know, that, that's how I grew up. I grew up uh, spending a lot of time in the bush, um, spending a lot of time hunting. And, you know, as I progressed in life, left school, went to college, did, did my stint, as I'll just leave it at that. But, you know, I managed at a very young age to look at purchasing a fairly large parcel of land. Now, this is where the first part will be different. The parcel of land, when I say fairly large, I bought it in uh, southern Zimbabwe and it was uh, 16,000 acres. Ooh. Yeah, and to us, that was a medium to smallish size ranch in that area. Most of them were 30, 35,000 acres. But I was still very young. I was 24 years old when that happened. I had, you know, I had to get a lot of uh, experience and help from the banks. Uh, but I had done agriculture college as well, so I had an idea what I was doing. Anyway, fast forward the next sort of five, six years, I went straight into cattle because that area sustained cattle. It was light on the rain, so uh, cropping wasn't good. But what it meant is that there was a very large and diverse population of wildlife that existed and coexisted with cattle to a certain degree. Right. And we never thought much of that, except that it was really nice and that we would go and do some culling sometimes for what we'd call rations for our labor force. We had a fairly big labor force, you know, 30 was permanent and 60 in the, in the high seasons. So we were able to feed our labor and also feed ourselves with some of the game. So it was more subsistence hunting. We weren't doing much trophy hunting. 
occasionally I'd have uh, friends and colleagues who come out and ask if they would like to hunt, and I would say, yeah, come on, come on, hunt. What that then led me to believe is that there might be a value to the wildlife. Right. And as the industry started uh, ratcheting up in the when I was there in the early to late 80s, we suddenly realized there was value in actually putting these game, uh, this wildlife into a system where you could increase them, you could protect them, and then you could also harvest them. And you could harvest them for a trophy fee that would then help you provide that protection and that assistance. And it turned out to be such a wonderful project and very, very viable that in a very short space of time, I'm saying within five years, I had 3,000 head of cattle when I started this project. In five years, I only had my pedigree herd left. Because what we did is we, we eventually removed the cattle, removed the internal fences, kept the water, put up some game fences on the dangerous influx areas, and put our money into game scouts, picking up snares and protecting the animals. Animals proliferated. So from that, from having a, a base of animals, I was, be able, I was able to provide safari-type hunts for paying clients. And they paid fairly well. And we could utilize all the meat with our labor, so nothing went to waste. So to me, this was a perfect situation. No kidding. Yeah. And it just grew and grew and grew. What I then did is I decided, well, because I now had a, a base of clients who were asking me, well, we love your planes game. Because basically in the ranching areas, we call them planes game, which is a non-dangerous game. Right. So, I mean, we had unbelievable amounts of antelope, like in Pala, and Kudu, and the huge big eland, the biggest antelope in Africa. We had waterbuck and bushbuck, but we didn't have the dangerous game, which was uh, categorized as the elephant, buffalo. At the time, it was rhino, which was taken off the list. Obviously, it became endangered. Right. Uh, leopard and lion. So, a lot of clients would like to have kept hunting the plains game, as we would call it, on, on my property, but also would like to have done a dangerous game, such as that, look... Can we do a plains game and a buffalo, the, Af the uh, Cape buffalo? And so from that, I, it led me to go and meet other people uh, who had dangerous game but didn't have the plains game I had. And we right. started doing a swap. Now, you must understand, this was all regulated, very heavily regulated by the government. And this is where the, the differences you'll see now start coming out. Okay. Um, I don't have as much or nearly as much experience in North America hunting, although I've, I've done it quite a bit here and I love it. The government becomes very heavily involved in licensing. Now, to become a professional hunter, that's the first difference. Here it's called a guide. There it's called a professional hunter. The reason is we also have a professional guide, and I'll explain the differences in that. The professional hunter, was a, once licensed, was allowed to take paying clients out to hunt uh, wildlife and uh, do it for gain. A guide was only allowed to take paying clients out to go and do photographic safaris. Right. So they weren't actually allowed to shoot the animals. But they would have to actually carry, on occasions, heavy caliber rifles and because they were taking on-foot photographs of, you know, a dangerous game, elephant, sure. buffalo. And as the the name says, they, it says they can be dangerous. You do <laughs> get charges, and you got to look after your clients. They're the ones that are paying. So that's where I got my first in into it. And, uh, I, I really excelled in it, and I spent probably 20 years as a professional hunter. It was took up about 60% of my time at, at, at that stage. Um, I still had my farming operations, as small as they were, to, right. to take care of. I had a wife and two small kids that yeah. you know I had to look after, but the, the, the hunting operations did really well. So besides the name of the professional hunter uh, against the professional guide and as, as opposed to the guide here in North America, I'm going to say some of the glaring differences um, that I've encountered. One would be the camp. Right. Um, hunting camps in Africa are normally very luxurious, and you end up you end up paying quite a bit of money. The, the expectation of clients coming out. And I'll give you an example, and I'll give you an average camp. An average camp will might be a tented camp. You'll have a bed, and a very nice appointed bed that has sheets, blankets, pillows set out for you when you arrive there. Every day, your clothes will be washed and ironed and placed on the end of your bed, so you don't have to worry about bringing a lot of clothing out. The food is always cooked for you and presented in a, in a proper manner, especially your dinners. A lot of time you're leaving early in the morning, spending the day out, you'll be taking packed lunches with you. And I can't help but think of the difference about sitting around a roaring African campfire with a nice cold 
beverage in my hand. Yeah. And it had actually been served to me by someone <laughs> <laughs> and waiting for the dinner bell to ring, uh, as opposed to the hunt I did here yeah, a couple of years ago with a very good friend of mine, whereby <laughs> we didn't even know that you had to take your own bedding. And uh, <laughs> we're told to, you know, buck ourselves up, go to Walmart and buy some bedding because otherwise you're going to just sleeping on the, on the bunk bed with nothing on. <laughs> uh, so we, we learned fairly quickly the differences. I, my expectation on that hunt was, was totally uh, a sober moment for me when, no when, when I arrived there. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you getting yourself into? <laughs> what am I getting us? And, and my buddy as well, who had done a lot of hunting with me uh, back in Africa, and you know, obviously his expectations. But you know, being, being the guy he was and the guy was, we, we looked at it as an adventure. Sure. And, uh, you know, we found out that the, uh, for instance, the camp, the cooks, they slept in the same area where they cooked and served us dinner. We, that, that was unheard of for us. But another really amusing part of that story was when we arrived, we arrived and there was this beautiful homestead and we thought, oh, that's nice. It'll be good. Well, within a very short order, they'd flown us out of there, <laughs> landed <laughs> us in the camp in the middle of nowhere and said, that's where you're staying. And we quickly realized that we maybe have bitten off a bit more than we can chew. Because the guides then came out and said, okay, guys, we're going to be um, getting on horseback tomorrow and going to where that scene, one grizzly kill. And we went, horseback? No one said anything <laughs> about horseback. So <laughs> we spent the first day trying to get used to horseback. I mean, I, I used to ride horses, but not for a long time. Right. And that day was a particularly long day. Uh, we didn't get the grizzly, but we've, we actually got a huge wolf, which was amazing to see. I've never seen one that was on the ground before and it was massive right and they actually got the horse to allow them to put this dead wolf across i was like well, are you kidding me this you know horses normally go crazy yeah so anyway we got back that evening very sore very tired and of course i do the zimbabwean thing and drink too much because i think that's an anesthetic <laughs> well all that caused was the next day sitting on the horseback with a hangover oh so. uh, yeah <laughs> yeah there's been a lot of differences another one was for instance the guides here work in, in, in my opinion, I might get a bit of trouble back with my old colleagues in Zimbabwe. I think they work harder because not only do they have to do the hard work of getting you up to the animal and making sure you get the, the trophy that you want, um, and that's extremely hard. Right. But once the animal's shot, they have to do everything thereafter. they they doing the, the trophy preparation themselves. They're doing all that. Whereas back in Africa, you normally have uh, professional skinners in your team and you would go back and you would drop the animal at the skinning shed ah. and there would be a team of skinners to actually skin that animal out exactly how you wanted that trophy presented. So there were a lot of differences that we had to find out. And so that's just some of the stuff that I, I could talk about. I mean, there's obviously the calibers that we used were different. Sure. Normally, if we're doing dangerous game, we had to have he heavy calibers. So I mentioned what the dangerous game were. The minimum caliber was a... 375 H and H, Holland and Holland. Right. That was your minimum caliber. That's your minimum. But as a professional hunter, you 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 didn't have margin for error. So whereas the 375 H and H would do perfect job of penetrating an elephant brain on a charge or a buffalo, it didn't give you any margin. Right. So most professional hunters carry a much heavier caliber. The 458 lot, which was mm -hmm. you know the 375 five form to the 458, was very popular. I found it had a bit higher pressure. So my personal caliber for a long time was a 416 Rigby. Right. Loved it. And lower pressures, especially when it's really hot, because you can hunt in some searing hot conditions out there. I believe it. Yeah, very, very hot. So, you know, that was, and that some of the professional hunters, and I also had one for a short time, was the, uh, was the old um, double rifle. I had a right. 500 Nitro Express, loved it. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> but, um, yeah, heavy to carry, but. Gave you a lot of confidence, especially, you know, when the bush is getting thick and the animals are, you know, out there to get you. So, you know, over here I found out quickly that the shots you're going to take are much longer, mm. number one. And the animals, the skin is actually a little thinner than, than what we get over there. So okay. the penetration is not as uh, critical with the ballistics of the bullet over here. So, you know, the first thing I did, I bought here, I bought myself a 30 out 6 because that was my, my, my planes game. Sure. Uh, but I believe I can shoot everything with 30 or 6 here. So, sure. You know, uh, there was just planes game. So you know, I, I toyed with the idea, well, let me get a 375. I went, why? You know, it's, uh, it kicks more, it's louder. It, it, more money. <laughs> it's more money. Yeah. And with a 30 or 6, we'll do everything. I also 
met a couple of guides here when I was here and asked their opinion. And they said, well, look, that's a good, nice, uh, heavy, heavy enough caliber to take everything. But if you take a longer shot, you might want to try a 300 wind mag. And I, I tried one and it was noisy and kicked. I'm like, geez, that will develop the- a flinch in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, we never, uh, typically we never uh, uh, took an animal over maybe 150, 160 uh, meters. That was, that was a, uh, and I'm talking planes game. Right. Um, the dangerous game was sometimes much closer, you know, really, really? closer. I mean, if they're coming at you, you know, you, <laughs> <laughs> you got to stand your ground. But so those are some of the differences that I found out there. What about uh, training? Was there a training process in order to be a professional hunter? Or could anyone just hang up a shingle and say, hey, I'm a pro hunter? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that question, Travis, because that's one of the most interesting um, aspects of becoming a professional hunter over there. I still maintain to this day, and I've been around the world a bit, that it's probably one of the most difficult programs for someone to go through to become a professional hunter. So I'll give you an idea what you do. You have to write, right in the beginning, you write a three-day exam to get what they call your learner's hunter. So you basically got your L plate like you have. But you can't do anything with that but be apprenticed to another professional hunter. And you have to be apprenticed to that professional hunter for two years and work under him for two years. And that professional hunter will teach you everything he knows, hopefully. Right. And normally you work for nothing. <laughs> you work for your food and your bed. Right? For two years. For two years. And he will teach you and he'll he'll make you do all the hard work and you'll learn and hopefully learn well. Because at the end, not only do you have to write another exam, but the, prof- the uh, professional hunter that you were apprenticing under has to write a recommendation for you. Ah. So you got two things. So anyway, the two years are up. The next thing you do now is write a five-day examination. So these, this examination covered, you can just imagine, every bite, flora and fauna and tracking and the regulations, firearms, calibers, it was all in there. If you did well and you passed that exam and the recommendation from your professional hunter was good, they would then invite you onto the final stage, which was called a proficiency test. Okay. Now, this way it got interesting. Okay. And I think that I still maintain this is probably the only, uh, Zimbabwe must be the only country in the world that does it to this degree. So what they do is all the people, all the, the, the group that have passed their professional hunters exams, the, the main one and had the recommendation, they will spend seven days out in a bush, but it's normally in one of the um, national parks areas. And this is, this is run and managed by the national parks board so it's very tightly run and what they have done over a period of time is decided what game they would normally cull for for certain purposes for management purposes um, sure. and they would then set aside x amount of animals to be taken by the professional hunters on their proficiency so for instance if we had a, a group of say 20 aspiring professional hunters we might get three elephant five buffalo and you know, sometimes, sometimes, very, 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 very seldom, we would get one of the other animals like a leopard or a lion. Right. But that was much a rare occasion. But then what you would do is you would split up into groups. So if there were 20, you would split up into four groups of, say, five. And each group would have an examiner from the uh, Zimbabwe Hunting Association, the ZHA, and a National Parks Observer. This is where it got interesting. That, those, that group would then go out every day and they would be tested on their bushcraft. They would be tested on things like tracking, on how to, how to set up a hunt, how to stalk a hunt. They, was, they would be tested on their trophy assessment. What's, you know, what size is that? Because, I mean, you can't just walk up to an animal. You've got a client paying this huge amount of money and not knowing what size that animal right. is, right? So you would test them all. In the, and in a short space of time, there would be two or three that were actually not going to pass. And then they became what we called in vertical commas water carriers. They carry the water. <laughs> and then the other three were so tested. They still have to be on. They still have to be there. They won't know. No one knows if they passed or not until later. Okay. So to say the three, and this is this is average. It's not that's not a right. it's, it's not a, a exact science as it was, but it, that those three would then be moved up and they would be tested even more. Until you the examiner would say, All right, uh, student A. You will take student B, he's your client, you'll stalk up to the elephant. Once he gets up to the elephant, student B, you will shoot the elephant. Okay, I want a frontal brain, 
Really? That's that's normally where a professional hunter would have to shoot an elephant because it'd be charging you. Right. And uh, student C, I want you to do the backup shot, uh, heart lung. And you could set the whole thing up. And 70% of the time, it went really well. 70% of the time, it didn't go so well. And, um, <laughs> you know, we then had to deal with that. Uh, try not to lose any of our, uh, our, uh, our students. And when I say... You know, that's what we try to do. Because after I had been a professional hunter for you know, 12, 13 years, they invited me to become an instructor and examiner on those proficiency tests. Very cool. They were amazing. And one of the things, and this is, this is uh, something that will go back to what we were talking about, uh, the comfort. So each group would then have to set up their own camp. And this is in the middle of the bush. And in that camp, they had to have a bed for the, the examiner because each examiner would then stay with that group, they'd have to have his tent, his bed, he'd have to have his clothes washed every day, everything that you would expect as a high paying client. Right. And you'd have to set that up, your food, your drink. So as an examiner, uh, it became quite quite a special thing because you're no treated kid. very, very well. No kidding. You know, you know you've, got, you've got your cold drinks at night, you've got uh, your clothes <laughs> washed every day, and everyone would step up. At the end of those seven days, the examiners then would sit down and we would discuss through each, each, each candidate that had come through and who would pass and who may actually get a restricted license. Now, a restricted license was interesting. They might say, listen, you're not quite there yet, but we'll give you a license to shoot planes game for right. now, to hunt planes game. Come back next year and we'll see if we can lift up the dangerous game for you. So to me, it was a very interesting way of doing things. And we always believed that the Zimbabwean professional hunter in the heyday was, it could compete anywhere in the world in his profession. No kidding. Um, so yeah, it was a very interesting time. Man, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it was, it was great. A lot of work. It was a lot of work, but uh, it, 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 it had its rewards, really, it did. So pro hunter, guide, we've got the two different distinctions, mm -hmm. safari operator. Yeah, well, okay, so the, again, the regulations and, and how this was run and was all done for the betterment of the industry. So a safari operator, if I wanted to bring in clients to hunt, I couldn't just do it as a professional hunter. I had to be a safari operator. So it means I had to have an area where I'm going to hunt them. And then I had to, had to do all the, um, the paperwork associated to that. So I had to adhere to the regulations. And safari operators were could be for hunting or could be for photographic. Okay. And it was run by a different association. So that was all integral part of sustaining standards for the hunting industry and the guiding industry. And it worked really well in the beginning. In the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. Obviously, you know, I won't go too much into politics, but after that, you know, things have changed quite a bit. Sure. Um, and unfortunately, corruption does take its uh, toll everywhere. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So if somebody came up to you from North America, from Canada, and they said, hey, I'm thinking about going on a hunt over in Africa, what advice would you give to them? Somebody's like, let's say me. Mm-hmm. Never been to Africa. It sounds really exciting. It sounds like a lot of fun, but when you look at it, there's tons of different companies, tons of different options. Um, what what should you look out for? You're absolutely right. And there's now you know, a ton of different countries that are offering in that. Right. You know, in 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 the early days, it was really Rhodesia and South Africa. Right. Now it's expanded, and some countries that had banned hunting um, have now realized that by sustainable hunting, they're actually protecting the animals and it can increase wildlife rather than let the poachers take their toll. Right. Um, that happened with the with the rhino, all but extinct. So there are a number of countries. Um, so I would first say, do your research. Decide where you want to go. Decide which country you want to go to and why you want to go there. Some countries offer different species of animals and you might want a specific spe uh, species of animal that you've always wanted and it's not really available in that country, or it might be on a protected list in another country. Right. Sometimes the regulations change. Um, that would be the first thing. Do some research on what animals you want. Uh, and then so you'll find out which country you want to go to. Find out which countries have a viable, sustained, and regulated uh, industry, hunting industry that's uh, right. like, as I said, Zimbabwe we used to have. Because that's going to offer you the best best form of protection if anything really goes wrong or sideways, you've got, you've got, you, you've got someone to talk to and um, get it sorted out. Right. A regulatory um, body yeah. or something that can step then, in. Once you've done that, then it's to, to now narrow it down to which outfit that you want to use. 
which Safari operator you want to use out there. And that is, again, research. You can go to the conventions like the SCI conventions and meet a whole ton of them and speak to them and talk to them. Um, there's Nowadays, with, uh, with the crazy internet out there, there's lots of reviews out there you can look at as well. So you can right. narrow it down a little bit. I mean, we know that can be used both ways, but you can narrow it down and you can go and speak to people. So uh, attending one of the big conventions is actually not a bad, bad way of doing it. Um, you can speak to a ton of people and make your decisions on that. Once you've decided which operator you want to go to and which animals you want to shoot, now you've got to start preparing. So the first thing I would say is that if you are going to go for a dangerous game, you're going to have to use a heavy caliber. So get proficient with the heavy caliber that you're using. We unfortunately had clients coming over knowing they had a heavy caliber, but they went far too big. Mm. Guys would come with a 460 Weatherby. Mm -hmm. And you could see after the first two shots on the range, they were scared of it. You know, they would be flinching and like, do you really want to shoot this? Or can I just give you my 375 and you can <laughs> place the shot exactly where I want to. So if you're going to heavy caliber, that's fine. Uh, get used to it. Work it. You know, and Make sure that you're proficient with it and you're not going to get a flinch on it because you don't want to pay all that money going all the way over there. And at that finite moment when you're squeezing the trigger, you have a flinch because you're scared of the rifle and you end up wounding a you know, $20,000 animal and it's gone. Right. So really, really uh, drill down into into that. The other thing you're going to find is the weather is obviously going to be different. Depending on what time of the year you hunt, it can get really, really hot. When I say hot, I'm talking up to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, so you've got to make mm -hmm. sure that you can cover yourself up. You're not going to get that heat exhaustion. Know that when you go over there, you're going to have to consume a, a pile of, of uh, water and the water over there, this is another thing you've already got to realize is difference over here. Water is scarce over there. Mm -hmm. And you better have enough water when you go hunting. Now, a good a good uh, outfit and a good professional hunter will make sure there's enough water, not just for him, but for you. That's his job. His job is to look after you. Make sure that you don't go down with heat exhaustion. That Make sure you don't hopefully get trampled by a dangerous charging animal. Right. That's his job. So, you know, you, you, you know you're going to have to do that. And crucial, crucial a good pair of well-worn and hunting boots. And I think that's the same as here, right? right. Look at the terrain you're gonna be using. We normally, our terrains are much flatter. We do, we do have, uh, but no, no major mountainous climbing uh, for any significant amount of time. But look at the terrain you're gonna use. There's obviously a ton of hunting boots. You can talk about them forever, but make sure they're broken in. Camel packs are good with, with the water, it's good. I'll give you one little uh, story about a camel pack. Though, sure. Because uh, I think this is, People who, who use a, carry, uh, a camel pack and carry a rifle uh, for hunting. Now, make sure when you carry your, your, if you have a camel pack and you're carrying your rifle, you know which side your drinking tube is going to come over your shoulder. Right. Now, why do I say that? Okay, so I'm left-handed, right? So I, I shoot left-handed. I'm actually right-handed. I shoot left-handed. Yeah. But I, um, so for that reason, I'll carry my drinking tube over my right shoulder. Why is that? Well, when I bring my rifle up to my shoulder, I don't want any impediment. Mm -hmm. I saw this firsthand with a colleague of mine, and he was charged by an elephant cow. And you more likely get charged by elephant cow with young than anything else okay. <laughs> when it comes to that, right? As a professional hunter, you wait as long as you can because you don't, um, you don't really want to shoot that cow to begin with because it's not part of the trophy list. Right. So it's going to be a self-defense shooting and there's going to be a ton of paperwork and investigation about it. Right. But when, once it gets too close, you have no choice. And he brought his, his rifle up uh, to his right shoulder. His tube was over the right and it slipped. <sighs> and uh, he, man he, he, he missed the brain. Um, it was enough to, to, to stop her just for momentarily. Luckily, the game scout who had the old uh, FN that we used to use, 308, managed to get... One shot in before it jammed, <laughs> which then allowed my colleague to load up again. I was too far away to actually assist at the time, but I, I got there and I said, what happened? He said, it slipped off my tube. I said, why is it that side? He said, I wasn't thinking, Darren. You know, and so you got to think of these things as well. That was that's a little a, story that I think everyone should know. That's um, a really good point. Yeah. You know, yeah. go train with what you're going to be using out in the field mm. and whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. Mm. Hopefully it only goes wrong in the training, right? Well, exactly. Um, Mitigate that yeah. there. Um, and I mean, if you look at the at the, the, the military, the, the top special forces in the world, you'll see that's what they do. Right. They, they train like that. 
So, yeah, so the, the, the differences in hunting in Africa and, and hunting in North America are wide and varied. But I would go there and I would say, you know what, just enjoy it because it's going to be a different experience. You're going to get to the camp and there's going to be domestic staff, believe it or not. Your food is going to be cooked for you. It's going to be served to you. Your drinks are going to be served to you. And it's part of the culture. Don't think that, oh, no, I can pour my own beer or, you know, don't. This is what they do. This is their job. And they love it. And they, you know, the, 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 the locals there are fantastic people. And they work hard. They, they love what they do. So you become part of that. You know, it's something that you, you, you don't say, well, don't make my bed. I'll make my own bed. That's right. their job, right? And they like doing it. It's p- part of the reason they're employed. That's a very good point. Yeah. And I've seen that around the world. I've seen people, you know, get, get angry when I was in India that someone poured their beer for them. I went, that's their job. You know, just say thank you and give them a tip or something. Don't be all, I right. can pour my own beer. Right. So I think when, when, when you go to Africa, that's what you want to do. Immerse yourself into that sort of culture. Don't, don't think it's, no one's, no one's being mean to anyone. It's, this is what happens there. You go there and they look after you. You like, you know, you're just like going to a hotel almost, right? <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. No I, I, I wouldn't mind doing it again myself. <laughs> I think I think we should probably look at lining something like this up. I was hoping you were going to say that, Travis. <laughs> Maybe uh, we take a look at the calendar, see what we um, can. I'm in big time for that. I have this uh, another bucket list to go back and do a nice uh, African Cape Buffalo again. Um, I've got some areas that uh, I got some really good contacts still there, so. It is definitely something I want to do, um, and maybe we can do it together. I would love to do that. That'd, That'd be, be fantastic. fantastic. Darren, thank you very much for sharing your stories with us. It's always enjoyable to sit down and talk with you. Thank you for making the time. Ah, Travis, a pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs>